Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of the BioXL webinar series. My name is Rosen Apostolov, and I will be today's host. Today, we have a presentation by Christopher Woods from University of Bristol, who will tell us about Biosim Space, which is one uh, big suite of application that lets you connect different uh, simulation codes. Before we start with the main presentation, I have to tell you that this webinar is being recorded and soon after the end of the webinar in the next day or two we will post a recording on the BioXL website and on our YouTube channel which you can review and see you can share with your colleagues and friends before we start for those of you who are not familiar with uh, BioXL I would like to give a, a very short overview BioXL is a European Center of Excellence for Computational Biomolecular Research. We work with several key applications in the area. These are GROMOX for molecular dynamic simulations, HADOC for integrative uh, modeling and docking, and CPMD for hybrid QMMM calculations. We work on improving the performance, efficiency, and scalability of this application. We also work extensively on improving the usability of different applications and tools used in life science. We work with several key workflows and platforms such as um, uh, Galaxy, Nine, Compsys, OpenFacts, and we develop such uh, automation pipelines. We also provide uh, extensive training program and uh, consultancy services. What might be of interest to you is that we uh, we are running several interest groups in, in different uh, areas, uh, such as uh, integrative modeling, free energy calculations, uh, biomolecular simulations for entry level users. That you can you can find more information about them on our website, and we welcome you to visit our support platforms. We have forums at ask.bioxl.eu, have an open chat channel. You can always get in touch with us through the website. At the end of today's presentation, we will have a Q&A session. So during the presentation, uh, at any time, you're welcome to use the questions tab. You can see it uh, in your control panel, where you can write your question. And when we are done, I will uh, let you speak directly to Chris and ask your question. If there is a problem with the microphone, we don't have a good audio, I can read the question on your behalf. So please uh, feel free to type in your questions as the presentation is proceeding. And now, with no further ado, I would love to present Christopher Woods from University of Bristol. He manages the the Research Software Engineering Group at the University, and he is an IRC Fellow and Joint Chair of the uh, UK uh, Research Software Engineering Association. He obtained his undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in chemistry from the University of Southampton, and he's been working with Professor Jonathan Essex before moving to Bristol as a chemist, developing software and algorithms for modeling of bi biological molecules and systems. Uh, in 2016, he started the RSE group at the University of Bristol with the Advanced Computing Research Center. On the slides, you can find contacts of Christopher at, and you can get in touch with him. So I would like to say thank you, Christopher, and um, I would let you continue with your main presentation. Thank you very much, Hassan. So I'll share my screen. And then I assume, I hope now everyone can see my screen. Yes, we see yes. well. Perfect. Well, thank you for the kind introduction and for the invitation to come and speak to you today about Biosim Space. Um, as I said, I work at the uh, University of Bristol in the Advanced Computing Research Centre. And if you want to download a copy of these slides, uh, you can use the link at the bottom, so just to my website slash talks. Now, Biosim Space, before I sort of explain what it is, I think it's actually easier just to show you. So I'm going to come across here, and this is actually Biosim Space running in the cloud, and I'm interacting with this in a web browser. So what does it do? Well, it basically enables you to 
run simulations, run calculations without uh, having any kind of uh, knowledge of how to use it. So ultimately here, we're gonna start with Biosim Space and this particular uh, notebook, this Jupyter notebook is to actually run an interactive MD simulation. So here we've imported Biosim Space. We've now loaded up some molecules. And how many have we loaded? Well, loaded up 631 molecules. And then we're gonna define a simulation protocol. So for this particular simulation, we're gonna run an equilibration. So here we defined an equilibration protocol. And now that we've loaded up some molecules and we've specified a protocol, we can now run an MD simulation just by going biosimspace.md.run system protocol. So now we have some MD running. Is it running? Yes, it is. It's going. How long has it been running for? At the moment, just 0.16 minutes. But we can interact with this MD simulation as it is going. So what's the total energy at the moment? It's currently 6,500 kcals per mole. But we could then format that nicely. So here you can see we've done 3.2 picoseconds of dynamics, and it's currently 6,400 kcals per mole. But if we run this again, we've now done 4.4 picoseconds, and we can keep doing this. It's not good enough just to get text output because we're working in Python land. We can use things like numpy, matplotlib, etc., and just plot these things. So this basically is the temperature and then the energy live as the simulation is going. And if I rerun this cell, it will get more of the data that's being generated. And we can see we've got some more information come through. As well as looking at the simulation in terms of the raw data, we can also get 3D views. So we're gonna connect a viewer now to the simulation. And if we view the system, what you should see now, and I apologize if this is a bit slow, you'll see now this is basically the 3D snapshot at this particular time. So if I zoom in, you can see this is the molecule being simulated. And if I rerun this cell, it will get the next latest snapshot, which we can then look at. Now the simulation is producing data. The data is sitting in the cloud and it's producing a trajectory. So here we can then grab the trajectory out. This is the trajectory produced so far in the simulation. So how many frames have we got? We have five frames and we can pull those frames out. So here they are. Now the way the Biosim space works is a wrapper around lots of other tools. So by default, we get trajectories in MD traj format, but it's very easy for us to also get them out in MD analysis format. So you have all of those tools available to you to analyze this kind of data. And of course, when you have that data, you can then run an analysis. So for example, here, this is calculating a root mean square deviation. And that's what's been going on so far. So that's basically what Biosim Space does, but now let's go into detail. What actually is it? So we can say, why Biosim Space? Ultimately, this project started because I was watching researchers basically trying to work out how to run molecular simulations. So typically you'll be going, a researcher will say, how do I do something? How do I add in a loop? How do I minimize a system? How do I parameterize a molecule? And the way that someone will find out how to do it is you search the web. And you search the web and you go through the search results one by one, and generally you'll find a tutorial, a blog post, or a script, and you'll go to that page and you'll follow the instructions in that blog post, and it will either work or it won't work. If it doesn't work, you then basically go back to the search results and you choose the next one, and it will work or not work. If you're lucky, you find a blog post or some instructions or a tutorial that actually does work and you're happy you've done what you wanted to do. Sometimes though, you find instructions that look like they work and everything completes without error, but actually it's not really worked. You've basically made a protein that's rubbish, but you can't tell that, so it's actually failed badly. But most of the time, actually, to be honest, you never find something that actually works. And this means that you'll go through all of the search results and ultimately give up because you can't find out how to solve your problem. And this is a problem for us as a community of molecular modelers we're really not good at sharing instructions on how to do things and at sharing best practice. We make it very difficult for newcomers to learn how to perform basic molecular simulation tasks. We decided as Biosimspace to try and solve this. So we got together as a community. So essentially it's a collaboration between the UK and the US, and it was in response to one of the UPSRC software flagship funding calls. So it's a collaboration between myself and Adrian Mulholland at Bristol, Julianne Michelle in Edinburgh, Charlie at Nottingham, Francesco in UCL, 
together with Cressets and Genta Evotech, and then John Tadira, Molsey, Michael Schertz, and D3R in the US. And we looked at the field and we said, what is actually the software problem? Why is it so difficult for us to share knowledge about how to run simulations? And it's because if you look at all of the software that we have in our community, it really doesn't fit together very well. So if you write a tutorial on how to do something using Gromax, but you as a user are working with Amber, then it's really hard to mix and match between these different codes. Effectively, there are lots of gaps between the codes. And the result of this is because we have very little compatibility and interoperability between all these tools, is we end up writing scripts that are really brittle. They're bespoke for particular code workflows. And so it's really hard for them to be kept up to date or shared. Now, one way you could solve this problem is you could, as a community, we could all get together and say, OK, we all have many different file formats. We all have different codes. We all have different ways of working. As a community, we could say, let's get the great and the good together and we'll create a brand new standard format for biomolecular simulation. We'll create a brand new standard simulation package. We'll create a standard sets of workflows and everybody will be encouraged to use the standard. The problem with this top down approach is that, of course, it's difficult to get everybody to sign up. And what would happen is instead of creating a new standard that would solve everything, we just create yet another set of file formats, which will be a yet another set of in incompatible, uninterruptible things. So we think the right solution is to work with what we've got. Instead of trying to replace all of the tools that we have in the field, we need to create the shims, fill in the gaps between all of these codes so that we can translate from one file format to another, we can translate from one input file to another and make sure all of the tools can work together, make it easy to plug them together into one thing. And that is Biosim Space. So our solution is bottom up. Biosim Space is a collection of shims that make it easy for us to plug together all of the existing codes that we have. So you saw when I ran the simulation on the notebook at the beginning, I didn't say what MD package to use. Biosim Space found an available MD package and just used that. I didn't have to say what trajectory anal analysis software to use. Biosim Space found the analysis software and just used that. Now, all of the tools that we wrap up are exposed in Python and everything is decided we will use everything in Python. Why? Because Python is insanely popular now. I call it the Facebook of programming languages because effectively everyone's in Python because everyone else is in Python. And it's also quite a cool programming language. And then what we've done is we've been ensuring that all of the tools that we use in the community can all be accessed using a common simple API, i.e. we have the same interface to run dynamics in all dynamics packages, the same interfaces to do alignment, the same interfaces to do trajectory analysis. And this means that then we can write Biosim space Python scripts that can then act as workflow nodes that can plug into existing workflow engines. So for example, we can plug these into Nine, Pipeload Pilot, Ecstasy, Run the Command Line, etc. And this means that then we can write scripts which you can share, use with your own codes as they're installed, and then use them from the command line, from a workflow engine, or interactively in a Jupyter Notebook, as I showed at the beginning. So you think, you know, this is something people have already been doing. So for example, if I wanted to write a workflow node, so the node would load a protein looking complex, it would run equilibration for a certain number of steps, calculate the RMSD with respect to the starting structure, and then output the equilibrator structure of the plot of, our, plot of the RMSD. This is something that is very easy to write if you choose a particular software package. So I could easily write a bash script or a Python script which could do this if I was choosing to work with Amber, or I was choosing to work with Gromax. The key from Biosim Space is that it lets you write one Python script that will do this workflow in any file format, using any available MD package, using any available trajectory analysis tool. And then when you output files at the end of the workflow node, it outputs them in the same file format as was used for input. So then you can take individual nodes and effectively rewrite them in Biosim Space without affecting all of the rest of the workflow nodes in the whole workflow. So if we visualize this workflow, this is the one where you put in a protein ligand complex and out comes the equilibrated complex and the RMSDs. This is what a workflow node will look like. And the idea is you write a biosim space node that basically does the work within this box. And then that node can be plugged into nine, pipeline pilot, ecstasy, 
can be run in a Jupyter notebook or run from the command line by placing in the inputs as arguments. So this is a BiosimSpray script, which actually does all of that. I'm not going to work you through all of it because it's obviously a lot of Python, though not that much considering how much it's doing. And you can see here we're importing BiosimSpace. We're creating a node which is going to do the equilibration. And one of the key things we want in BiosimSpace is actually the nodes have authors. So you can see here we've added in the author of this particular node and we've added the license. And that way people who write BiosimSpace scripts can be credited with their work, you know, who actually did the effort of writing this. And when they share it, they can then get the credit. The nodes have inputs. So here we're inputting the complex as a file set. Nodes also have outputs and we're going to say it's going to output a file, which will be, say, the RMSD. Here, this line is reading in the molecules into the system from those input files. And this read molecules basically can read pretty much any molecular file format. And it works regarding auto detects the file format. Here, we're now getting a protocol for equilibration. And then when we do md.run, what's happening is BiosimSpace is going, which MD packages do I have installed on my computer? For the MD packages I have installed, write the correct input files, write the command files, submit and run the simulation, and then go. And when it's submitted and running, you've then got a process. That process can be used to get an interface to get things like the trajectory. So here we're getting a trajectory out. And then at the end of the node, we then produce some output and we say, OK, output from the node, some molecules that we save. And you can see here we're saving the molecules in the same file format as they came as input. And then when the script is finished, we then validate that the node has actually produced everything that it promised it was going to produce. And if it doesn't, you then get some errors. That node runs as a command line script. It will run eventually within NIME. And as you saw when I demoed it at the beginning, it runs as a Jupyter notebook. So this is the plan. This is what we're trying to develop. So how much of this actually now exists? Well, currently, we have written many of the file conversion parsers. So we can read and write files in AMBA formats, in the Gromax formats, in the Charm formats, and your PDB and multi-standard. We've also written drivers for MD programs, particularly AMBA Gromax, and we're working on Charm, and we'll be doing NAMD as well, which I think NAMD is mostly done now. We've written interfaces for the molecular analysis tools for MD analysis and MD TRAJ, and we've written the node interface for command line, Jupyter, and most of the way through Nine. The other thing we've got is a molecular search parser, which enables you to search for bits within molecules, which is very, very useful. Like here, we can search for all molecules which contain alanine and within three angstrom, five angstroms of a ligand. Most of the work going on at the moment is basically working on setup. So we're basically trying to now get automatic setup of, co of molecules. And this is basically writing thin wrappers around T-leap, antichamber, palm check, SQN, and PDB to GMX. We've been solvating molecules using T-leap and solvate. And then we've taken code, which has come out of the FE setup project, to enable us to automatically map ligands together to do single topology free energy calculations, and are writing drivers for single and dual topology free energy calculations in AMBA, Gromax, and SOMD. And we hope to have that ready in sort of like the end of August for a release just before September. In terms of how long the project's been going, we're basically about now 10 months in, and the project is going to go until the end of 2019, and we're currently on target. So I hope this is all going to be producing things that everybody will need and want. So just as an example of setup, this is a BiosimSpace script, which is nearly working, which will do automatic setup of uh, some molecules. So here we are loading in some molecules in Gromax format, the Grow and a GrowTop file. We're extracting here the protein from the file and the ligand. And then we're parameterizing it using the FA4, FF14SB force field, which is basically going to run and this in the background goes off and uses PDB to GMX or it uses TV depending on what is available. Then on the next line it goes off and basically runs a GAF parameterization using antichamber and SQM using an advanced protocol we developed in FE setup that copes with a large number of different types of molecules. So it's not just a simple just run antichamber. Then we solvate the system here in TIP3P and this is a wrapper around TV or solvate. And then finally down here, we can see we're doing the md.run with a minimization and equilibration using a standard protocol for these. So at the end, we can then output the system, which has been fully parameterized. So this is a software project, but software should not be developed in a vacuum. You need to have actual science to do with the software so it drives you on and you can then hit your deadlines. 
So it also helps you fix bugs. Bugs are very important to find. So we have two grand challenge applications that we're running during this project. The first one, which is going to be running basically from September this year, is a automatic setup and running of binding for energy calculations challenge. So this is why we're collaborating with the D3R group. They're going to be giving us access to the D3R data sets. And this will enable us to run binding for energy predictions using a range of different tools, a range of different force fields, and basically run a comparative study to say which of the tools, methods, and force fields will actually give the best prediction in this blind predictive challenge. We will then be running another grand challenge in the beginning of next year. And this is going to be basically when we write to the metadynamics layer for the code. And this will be basically automating the running of uh, metadynamic simulations for looking at binding kinetics. Now, when I started this um, sort of uh, this talk, I showed you Biosim Space running on Jupiter. When we first conceived the project, we were thinking of Biosim Space being useful from the command line and from within workflow nodes. But what we quickly discovered is that people really liked using it on Jupiter, and Jupyter Notebook seems to be a sort of a very popular way of getting access to it. So how does this work? Well, for those of you who don't know Jupyter, it's basically a web page which gives you access to a Python interpreter. The way it works is you have your web page running on your client. So it could be like your iPhone, iPad, or your notebook. So I could have run the demo I started with on my iPhone. It works fine. And then you have Python running on your server. So the Jupyter Notebook's on the client, and then you have a Python kernel running on the server somewhere. What happens is as you use the notebook, you're sending Python snippets over the network to your Python kernel. Those Python snippets are then executed on the server. That will then produce some output and a result. And then a renderable version of the result is then sent back to the notebook to be rendered. What this means is you've effectively separated the user input and the rendered output onto the client while all of the compute, and more importantly, all the data that you need to do the compute is stored on the server. This makes it as a very efficient way of actually using a piece of simulation software. It means that instead of having to install everything locally, you can just go to a web page and everything is just there. And also, because all your data is on the server somewhere, it means you're not moving data backwards and forwards between your laptop and the server. This is particularly visible when you think of the 3D molecule render that I was showing at the beginning of this talk. That's based on something called NGL view. And effectively, what NGL view is doing is it's analyzing the data, it's generating 3D representations as WebGL, and it's only sending the WebGL data across the network to your, to your client running on your notebook or your phone so that then it renders it. So here, and this is where you'll be thinking, oh, this is really jerky. It's only throwing a few frames per second. But actually, this is running at 30 frames per second, even though the client is sitting at home in Bristol and the actual server is running on the cloud in the eastern United States. And what you see, if you can just catch on the top right here, this little blob is the little bits of data that are transferred. So only the data that's needed for the visualization is actually transferred across. Now, the way that we run Biosim Space using Jupyter is we run it on the cloud using a standard called Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a container orchestrator. So many of you may have heard of Docker. Docker is a way of basically containerizing your application so that you don't have to worry about you know, its dependencies. Everything is contained within one Docker container. What Kubernetes does is provide a layer on top of Docker, which can then orchestrate those containers. So what you have is you have a set of servers typically running in the cloud. And so we have a cloud servers running in the eastern United States. And these servers are allocated, or these containers are allocated to the servers dynamically. And a container running on a server is called a pod. Now, the container orchestrator will network all of the containers together using named services and will then expose those containers to the public network using a load balancer. So when I connected to my Jupyter Notebook, it basically connected to the load balancer and a container was then automatically put onto a server to serve me. Now, if demand for your service increases as more people log on to your service, the Kubernetes will basically expand the number of pods which are spawned to match that demand. If you find demand for your service decreases, then the pods are destroyed. 
So effectively, the pods will grow and shrink as the work allocated to your service increases or decreases. If you find one of your pods fail or go silent, then the Kubernetes orchestrator will automatically kill the pod and then restart it. The other thing it enables you to do is it can actually upgrade pods in the background by turning them off and bringing up a replacement. And you can also do things like A-B testing. So it's really useful as a service to enable you to install software and then run services which are based on that software. Essentially, if all of that was like too long to read, you can think of Kubernetes as being effectively a scheduler for containers. So this is how we use Kubernetes on the cloud to run Biosimspace. So there's a website which is workshop.biosimspace.org, which is the thing I connected to right at the beginning of this talk. I connected over HTTPS, and when I connected, the Kubernetes service basically spawned out a pod here, which contained the Jupyter server and all of the Biosimspace software, which was then able to run and interact with me. This is all running on the Microsoft Azure uh, cloud, and essentially it's been configured to support up to 60 simultaneous users um, at once and the cost of that is about 11 pounds per day which is only about 4,000 pounds per year we think it's a really cost efficient way of again enabling lots of people to use the software without having to install it all and, and work with it but this then brings us to buy sim space on the cloud and the big question of who pays 11 pound per day is not too bad but you know still someone has to pay that so how can we get Biosim Space to work and be more self-sustaining? This is where the partnership with the cloud providers has come in. So we formed a partnership with Microsoft Azure and also with the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure to basically develop Biosim Space Cloud. The aim is to allow upfront charging of cloud compute and storage costs on a per simulation basis. So instead of you having to think, okay, I need to rent servers and rent disk and rent network and IP addresses and all of those little tiny details, Instead, you will have one cost, which is the cost to run the simulation. Now, the reason we can do this is because if you remember when I did md.run, it was basically running a system with a particular protocol. And this means that Bison Space can actually estimate upfront how much compute and how much storage a simulation is going to take. And this means we can predict on different resources how much it will cost to run on different clouds, on different servers, and then pick the cheapest or the most efficient one for you. This means we can present you with a cost to run the simulation up front. You can then decide whether or not you want to accept that cost. And if you do, that cost is then guaranteed. You're then able to do things like set a daily cap of how much you want to spend per day, and also things like the maximum runtime for the simulation. And with all of these sort of constraints of the daily cap and the maximum runtime, you can then have the best resource allocated to you depending on what you've then set. So for example, here, this is what a Biosim Space Cloud script, what we're working towards to be able to produce, where effectively at the top of the script, you're going to log on to your Biosim Space Cloud account. This basically logs on and with your account, you will have daily limits. So you could say, I don't want to spend more than 10 pounds per day, and I don't want any simulation to last more than one week. We're then creating the system and the protocol, and then here, we're now going to do the bss.md.run for a system and a protocol. By a simspace on the cloud then goes, aha, I can see you're trying to run this type of MD simulation with this number of atoms. And I know using this particular package, it will take this long to run on a cluster of this size. And so it will go through all of the different resources available. It will work out which of these is the most cost effective for the thing you've got. And then it will go, does this actually fit into your cost and your time constraints. If it does, the simulation runs and everything is fine. If it doesn't fit into the constraints, you have an exception, the cost breaks constraints error, and then it will then ask you for permission to break one of the constraints. So you'll get an email request or a console request basically saying, can I break one of these constraints? Can you spend more amount of money per day or are you willing to wait longer for the simulation? Once you've decided on what you want, because this is blocking, once you give your permission, we then get a permission object. If the permission is granted, then the simulation can then run using the new constraints that you've set. Another possible thing that could go wrong is that you don't actually have any money to pay up front for the simulation. And in that case, you have an insufficient funds error. And so you're then emailed to request some money because you have to pay somehow. And then we block here waiting for the funds for a maximum of 48 hours. 
and then if you get the money it will run the simulation and if not then we can't run anything now the way this actually works on the back end so this is what we're setting up is we're deliberately working this as a multi-cloud system so we chose to work with two cloud providers to make sure we don't use any technologies which lock us into a single provider and so everything we've got is standards compliant open source etc so we could actually swap the cloud providers around and bring in all parts as we need so here we have on the left biosim space running in a jupyter notebook on kubernetes and so we've got the bss.cloud login logging on to the user's cloud account within the script once they've logged on they get an access key and this access key can then be used to authenticate this user on all other services first thing that happens now is when the person wants to run the MD simulation and we've worked out we do have a resource and it fits into the constraints is the access key is used to connect to an object store create a bucket for the simulation for that user and then the input files which are generated by Biosim space to run the simulation are then transferred to the object store under that bucket the next thing that happens is that the notebook running on Kubernetes will connect across to a function service so a function service is something called a Lambda service. If you come across Azure Functions or AWS Lambda, it's basically a function which automatically allocates resources on the back end to support the running of that function. So our MD simulations are being represented as functions on a function service. The authentication key is used to connect to the service, authenticate with it and say, we want to run this function. And here is the bucket in the object store where all of the input data exists. Once the Air function service is authenticated, it will then use that key to connect to the object store and copy all of the data from the object store through to an HPC disk, fast disk, which is basically a POSIX disk ready for the simulation. At that point, it can then use the servers that were allocated to that function to run MD. And as it's running MD on the servers, it will then produce output back onto the HPC disk. At the same time, a copy service starts running and this is then using the authentication key that was provided to copy the output dynamically back into the object store. As a user, you can be interacting with this object store dynamically and interactively. So as data appears in the object store, you're able to grab it out and then dynamically plot it and dynamically visualize it in the same way that you saw me doing at the beginning of the, with the demo that I was running. So you can get the energies, the graphs and everything else. Once the simulation is finished, the copy process will then do a verification on all of the data and it will basically check some to make sure all of the data from the HPC disk has been correctly uh, copied across to the object store. The object store is already automatically backed up and everything else. And so the data is now safe and it means that then we can basically shut down the function service, shut down the, function, the service running on the function service. Running on the notebook, we can use the key and the bucket location in the object store to then basically run all of the analysis and the results so it means the data is then available to look at now the data in the object store is written in a write protected manner so it's read only and this means that we can safely reuse this data from other scripts without fear of modification or deletion so simulation outputs that are produced are sitting in an object store they are read only and because in the same way we can estimate the amount of cost to run a simulation because we know how long it will take we can also estimate how much data is going to be produced so the upfront charge you have of 10 pounds per day or whatever that upfront charge is also covering one year storage of the data in the object store the key into the object store is effectively a document object identifier and will be converted into a doi enabling you to reaccess that data from other scripts or to publish it and make it accessible by others we are going to produce a web console which will allow researchers to manage outputs for example you could use that doi and control access permissions so basically enable other people to share it or make it public you can delete the output and receive a pro rata storage refund you can pay for extra year storage because only one year is paid for up front or if you want to archive it there'll be a one-off charge for the output to be archived and this is all being produced with the partnership of these two cloud providers because you need the cloud providers to provide effectively the backends to do all of this and we have engineers beginning to build this now. The interesting thing about Biosim Space for us as we've gone on this journey of producing it is it's really feeling like it's on the cusp of a change in the way that we do computing. 
So when we were starting Bison Space, we were thinking of it very much in sort of the batch computing world, where essentially you would have a simulation and you would submit it to a queue and then you'd wait and then the simulation would run and then eventually you'd get some results back. But as we've evolved, we realize that we're sort of moving now into this demand computing world where we have notebooks and interactive visualizations and interactive data analysis. And effectively, you can begin thinking of a Jupyter notebook not as being just a notebook itself, but it's also a repository where you have the documentation, the simulation, the analysis and the results all together into what's really an executable, reproducible, interactive paper. When I showed this to a group of PhD students, and sort of talking about the difference between demand computing and batch computing, one of the PhD students said, you've built the Netflix of simulation. And I think this is a really apt metaphor. Effectively, we're moving into a world where simulations are streamed on demand. You access them on demand. You're not going to wait in a queue. Now, there's no reason why demand computing has to sit on a cloud, but a cloud is a very, it enables this to happen. But I think as we move forward, in not just biosim space and other sort of simulation packages as well we need to think about how can we make our batch computing systems behave like demand computing systems how can we handle user accounts that can move between running in the cloud and running on batch how can we handle movement of data how can you run custom document images and how can you do usage and cost accounting so that was kind of a run through the whole of biosim space just want to give some acknowledgements to the team. So basically most of the work in terms of coding has been done by Lester Hedges and with Antonio May. Obviously there are other Bison Space partners with Giuliana, Adrian, Charlie and Francesco who have been really helpful. We thank the EPSRC for funding under that grant number. CCB Bison and HEC Bison, basically they are the umbrella organisations under which all of the community has been brought together and essentially the community under CCB Bison and HEC Bison has been massively supportive of Bison Space. They've been us with examples, workflows, etc. And we're working with them to basically try and find a way of enabling Bison Space to do all of their work. Also, particularly want to thank Kenji at Microsoft, who gave us access to Azure, to the engineers at Microsoft, and also Phil Bates and Gerardo and Oracle again for giving us engineers and access to the Oracle Cloud. And thank you to Bioexcel for inviting me and for hosting this webinar. So with that, I think I'm maybe a little bit under time. I'll hand over to the Q&A session. Thank you, Chris. That was a really interesting presentation. I would welcome everyone from our listeners to type in your questions in the uh, questions tab in the control panel, which, uh, and then I will give you the microphone to ask your question directly. I was uh, wondering, Chris, so when you, so you can have multiple, for example, MD packages who would uh, run a simulation and the uh, in space will automatically select the ones needed but how do you distinguish between uh, small differences in the methods that are applied or the integrators etc within each package uh, is so, there a control of that? so we're deliberately wrapping things at a slightly higher level so what we're saying is you want to do dynamics for a certain number of steps you want to do equilibration for a certain number of steps and so we're choosing a package based on that request we're not giving you the option of basically give you different decisions actually within the integrator because that's a very low level decision which is could be very specific to an individual package now it is possible within biosim space to pass that information down so if you pass in you, you can control and say i would like a specific integrator i would like a specific set of parameters so don't use the default protocol use this very specialized protocol and as you do that you eliminate the ability for biosim space to choose so what will happen is it will then go okay you've specified something that only exists in gromax i now only have the choice of using gromax and if gromax is not installed then i just have to tell you sorry it's not installed you can't use it but what we're trying to do is basically smooth over these differences and sort of describe simulations at a slightly higher level. Um, the reason for this is because Biosim space is very much aimed at the more general community. So uh, we don't, with the more general community, we want things to be done and we don't really need to go into the details of exactly how it is done. And so the tiny details of how you do it, that's what we're letting the community decide through basically how they've defined these protocols. Thanks a lot. Uh, 
So we have several questions now. So first one we have from Alexander Simperler. Hi Alexander, can we hear each other? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, so yes. You, you can speak. Yeah, I just was wondering, that's that's a very good idea what you do, uh, so you write the wrapping software in a, in a, in a good format, uh, what people know. And obviously you need uh, an MD simulation at the other end to do it. Let's say you have AMBA, but not everything is free. How do you handle this? Is this included in the £10 I pay and do we do software as a service? So there's like two questions for that. First one is buy sim space uses what is available. So if we ignore the cloud part, buy sim space also runs as a command line on your cluster, or it runs as a nine node on your existing you know, industrial cluster, etc. So if you already have Amber installed because you've already paid for Amber and buy sim space sees you've got Amber, then it can use it. Buy sim space running on the cloud, obviously then we have an interesting world where actually effectively what buy sim space is doing is providing software as a service. So this upfront charge of saying, okay, this simulation could cost eight pounds of compute. What we're actually saying with the cloud providers is one, that they guarantee that cost, but two, we want to add a tax to it. So we want to say, okay, it's gonna cost eight pound of compute plus data, but let's now add another pound or another two pounds, which will then be the cost for the software. For the open source software, because we basically track everything that we're using, we'd almost like to pay royalties. So effectively, if you're using Graumax, it would be good to then send royalties back in the same way you get royalties as a singer you know, on Spotify. If you're using something like Amber, we would like to do deals with the commercial software providers to say, actually, can we find a way that we can turn your existing site license into a pay-as-you-go license? And I think this is one of the big challenges, really, that the cloud presents to the commercial software industry because it very much pushes you to a per use pay as you go license model rather than an upfront site license model. So luckily, most of what we want to do is open source, so we don't really hit this too much. But there are a few things where we will need to be negotiating these kind of cloud licenses. I hope that answers your question. Yes, perfect. Yeah, thank you. So we have another question from Rachel Jensel. Obviously, if I can turn you on your microphone. Hello. Hello. There you are. Hello. Hi. Um, <clears throat> hi, Christopher. Very impressive uh, presentation. Um, but I'm wondering if you're using the system in the cloud. It's sort of set up to be very automated. And my experience in using Amber and doing a lot of simulations is that very often, especially if you're using non-standard amino acids or uh, non or different DNA addicts, you really have to customize the parameterization. Is this going to be possible um, through your use, you know, through Jupyter Notebooks, through the cloud uh, and your scripts to include um, specialized parameterization and to, to go back and forth in terms of optimizing parameters or when their parameters are not found? Uh, yes. Um, so this is what I think I could try to hint this is we're not just having a, a simple wrapper around antichamber or around SQM, et cetera, because you're right, you have this issue that actually parameterization is really difficult and you do need some interactivity or you need things to catch things. So we're building this on top of a project called FE Setup, which came from the CC Biosim and Equisim communities. And in there, we basically caught all of the errors or a large number of the errors you can get in parameterization and then worked out how you could automatically fix them. And then for the things you couldn't automatically fix, how could you then make it easy for the user to then say what they want to do? And so Biosim Space is building on top of that because um, this is almost like a continuation project. With the, the system object, so when you load up molecules, you can parameterize just by calling the parameterize schemes, but you have full control to go into individual atoms and you can set parameters by hand. You can pass in parameter files and say, use these exactly, don't use an automatic parameterization. And also when you run a simulation or you run a parameterization, you may have been noticed be talking about protocol. 
protocol is a way of specifying how to do something. And what protocol does is provide a way for the community to really control how you have this high level representation of running. So with protocol, different groups can basically say, parameterize DNA using this protocol, parameterize a protein using that protocol, parameterize these weird things using this protocol, et cetera. And what we hope to do is collect these protocols together and effectively use that as the, the store of best practice that we can then share amongst each other. Because at the moment, we don't really share these protocols with each other in any sort of consistent way. So it's kind of, that's where the sharing will happen. And, and I just want to make a comment. I think that this would be a really powerful tool for teaching um, how to do simulations when people are first starting out, especially through the use of the scripting and the Jupyter Notebooks and acting as accessing a cloud. Um, have you thought of developing any educational tools um, around this system? Um, yes, so the Jupyter Notebook work, and we built that actually for workshops. So what I showed you at the beginning was an excerpt from a molecular simulation workshop. And indeed, if you go to workshop.biosimspace.org, or you go to biosimspace.org and click on the link from there, you'll actually see these are teaching workshops. Um, but it was from the students using the teaching workshops in Jupyter that we suddenly thought, actually, this is a this is not just good for teaching, it's actually good for, for real simulations. We're kind of the backwards way around, actually. Um, but no, I think this would be fantastic for teaching. Um, and again, a way of us being able to share blogs and share, share best practice and actually bring new people up so we don't have them just frantically Googling and then not know how to do anything. And, and you said you can access that through, uh, what do you say, workshops? Uh, yeah, so it's, um, if I, I think I can type it in here, but it's basically HTTPS uh, workshops.biosimspace.org slash hub slash TMP login. I think if I click on that, I think I get to the page. Maybe, maybe oh, so it's work can... Sorry, it's workshop. Oh, I always get this wrong. We can add this later to the slides, probably will be easier. Yeah, we can add it to the slide, but essentially it's workshop and uh, because there's no there's no user accounts with it, you just automatically go in and you can then start using it and running with it. Um, it is linked within uh, the presentation and, and on our website. Yeah. Oh, great, thanks. Thanks, Rochelle. And uh, we have a few more questions from uh, Alexandra, actually. Alexandra? You have a couple more. Can you hear us? Uh, anyway, I will uh, read. Yeah, can you hear oh. me? Yeah, 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 sorry. Thanks, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so one question you answered already, the software as a service business. I think this is this is the way to go. Uh, and then, of course, you mentioned your project is uh, li li stopping in 2019. What happens after it? So at the moment, I guess you have funding to develop. So what do you do next? Do you do a spin-off or where is this going? That's a very good question. So I, well, we should be able to finish most of it. So the, what we have is we have a very detailed software engineering plan, which we're on target with. And that has most of the code developed and finished by kind of February next year. Um, so then leaves us with about 10 months through user support, documentation, debugging, etc. There are two avenues going forward. So we work with commercial software providers and we're working with cloud providers. And what I'm hoping is that um, effectively the tax on using it in the cloud is sufficient to keep the front end going and sort of keep sort of development going through there. And then we've built enough goodwill in the community that ultimately we're not the ones having to wrap everyone's code and we're not the ones having to develop all the protocols but instead it becomes almost self-sufficient where as a developer of a new software tool you want to wrap it to make it available within biosim space and i think the motivation to do that is this idea of as i said royalties effectively that if we're using it and your code is used by somebody else then even if your code is open source you should be getting royalties from that cloud usage so mm -hmm. it's kind of I think that's how we'll get sustainability. I mean, ultimately, it shouldn't be that we as the group are the ones running it and 
we are this sort of single point of failure. We really want this to be a community yeah. thing. That's the thing, but somebody somebody needs to check. But another idea, of course, could be that the wrapper is written by the actual software uh, company, uh, because once it's it's. Uh, uh, let's say you could put this on a marketplace, that's one, uh, so software vendors could see this uh, because you have crossovers as well with materials modeling and whatever, that's what I can see because you can put your your, your protein on somewhere on top and give it a different twist, uh, so that for example the software vendor writes the wrapper. Yes, so as I said we, we are working with software vendors who want to put their things into this and this is why we, we did this in partnership with the cloud providers, so I think it's is the cloud providers actually really providing it and making it part of their system and getting almost like a certification scheme that means that if you run a piece of software, the royalties go to the right place, which is then how we get trust that, say, one software vendor won't try and steal everything and run away. So I think this would work if we have trust in the community that we're all doing this together and everyone's being rewarded. Um, I think it would fail if it ends up being one company or one group who are just doing it to the exclusion of everybody else. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, now we have a question also from Ian. Ian, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear. Okay, okay. Um, I'd like to hear a bit more. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, I'd like to hear a bit more about the metadata side of things. Um, so you did touch on it. Um, so my specific question is, how is relevant metadata managed, which records how the simulation was run? I'm hoping that, that that's captured. <laughs> yes, that, obviously that does have to be captured and that is captured. So everything that's run is they're all run in Python objects. So essentially what you have are Python objects which are uh, data preserving. So when you load a molecule up, um, it's loaded up effectively into a Python molecule and a biosim space molecule, a biosim space system. And that biosim space system collects all of the metadata regarding the molecule that's been loaded from those files. When that then gets passed into the md.run with a protocol, the protocol contains all of the metadata and all of the data of how the simulation is going to be run. And then it then runs the system Process is there. The process object that's created contains all of the data, which is then as a Python object of how the thing is being run. And then effectively, you're then querying that process object. Now, when it comes to the end of the simulation, you're outputting things at the end. The output of the things at the end, it really depends on what you want to keep. So, as a node, you're normally only outputting output files or graphs or things like that. Within the node, everything is saved, but then when you go beyond the node, only the, the actual relevant output data is passed on. So the metadata tends not to leave the node. If you wanted it to leave the node, you'd have to create another output stream from the node and then pass the output that metadata out. But obviously it's all stored within the node, so you can always go back and query that. We can look at so, so I, how I, to I, do provenance logs. That would be a good way to capture it. Yeah, I mean, there are logs. It's obviously everything is on the cloud version. Everything is stored in the object store as well. And you can just go into the object store and query the things that are in that. But the, what we took, again, was this kind of decision is sort of where is the layer of, where's the user interest? The user is really only interested in something running. And there's a layer below which they really are not interested in what happens. So we try not to report things to the user that is they, they don't care about. The data's there and it's stored, but we don't tend to show it to them. So, so there's a great opportunity here. Uh, you've probably heard of the FAIR principles. Um, yeah. So the opportunity is to make use of systems like your engineering here um, so that the user is supported in how they manage their data, including metadata, and in, um, you know, in agreement with the FAIR principles. Maybe at the moment it's not it's the most users may not be well enough educated in you know their principles are important but i think by supporting them through automated systems because they're all, fair principles are all about supporting machine readability um yes. i think you would be helping the users even though at this point in time they may not fully see the, the long-term benefits for getting that right so i, yeah. I i'd hate to think I'm... we're missing an opportunity on that well, no, as I said, everything is stored. And the nice thing about doing this as a Jupyter Notebook yeah. is once you publish it, 
that's all the information. And because we've got the cloud connection, it means somebody else can rerun that exact Jupyter notebook and re-get the things they want to right. get out of it. One of the things we think is quite interesting that's pointed out to us is that if something is published, it means and people are happy with sharing, you can actually say, take a simulation and a protocol, and because we can fingerprint that, we can go, has this ever been run before? Has anyone ever run this protocol on this system before? If the answer is yes, just give them the results. Don't run the simulation again. So it'll actually make it much easier for us to share simulation outputs. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have also a question from Adam. Adam, can you hear us? Yes, hi, uh, Chris. It's Adam Carter here at TPCC at the University of Edinburgh. Hi, Adam. Um, so I come from a sort of a, an HPC centre, so I'm kind of interested in, in the, the scale of some of the things that are being run in the cloud. You mentioned that, the, that you gave some figures for, for 60 simultaneous users. I wondered kind of yeah. roughly what size of simulation in terms of cores this was, this was based on. So the 60 simultaneous users are for users for the front end. So if um, I go back to the slide, I think I can, can you see my slides? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically the 60 simultaneous users are the people on the Jupyter notebook side. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, that's very, very, you know, it doesn't require really anything. It's sort of like half a core per person um, because yeah. work doesn't need to happen really on the Jupyter notebook side. Yeah. The expensive bit is the thing that happens on the serverless side. And essentially for that, that's why we need to do having people pay up front. Because on the serverless mm -hmm. side, a function could be run Gromax on 1,024 cores. And so we're yeah. actually putting the, the core count as part of the function definition. So then mm -hmm. what happens is that it chooses, okay, should I run it on Gromax 256, Gromax 512, Gromax 1,024, what fits into the cost and time budget calculation. And so, yeah. That's how you then get the separation. So we can support 60 people who are interacting, doing data analysis, blah, blah, blah. But then for simulations, and that's free, for simulations, they're going to have to pay because computing yeah. isn't free. No, absolutely. The, the tax on the front end or the tax on the service, I think then, or the cloud providers are agreeing, that can then basically fund all of the running of the, the front ends. Yeah. The interesting thing that I said at the end is that this is a model which happens to suit the cloud very well, but this is not cloud specific. It doesn't have to be this way on the cloud. For example, the serverless system could be Archer. There's no reason yes. why you could not put a, go and run this on Archer and use your existing set of cows to run it. And I mm -hmm. think this is why it's interesting with this transition point towards running things interactively and doing interactive data analysis and simulation, butting up against a kind of the, the batch computing view of supercomputing. I yeah. think things like this and like Galaxy and like the CryoEM work with Rely on, they're producing these on demand workplace managers and interactive notebook managers that are really making us think about how we provide compute to researchers in an on demand mm -hmm. manner. So, have you done any? Um, so, you're talking about going up to a thousand cores, which is, uh, which is, sounds like fine for what a lot of people would need. In, in terms of the efficiency of those kind of simulations, do you know? how they compare on the, on the cloud infrastructure to how they would compare on a, on a cluster uh, yes. or something like that? So um, with the Oracle cloud, um, what they have is it's a bare metal cloud and all of the hypervisors actually as hardware in the switch, they did a partnership with Mellanox. So you mm -hmm. basically have InfiniBand speed, I think it's about two times 40 gig connections and the scaling is pretty good. So we haven't run any benchmarks up to that size yet because you know that isn't yeah, as very expensive yeah. Yeah, but okay. uh, but they are very fast it's basically it's, it's what you would expect it's infinity band connected um very fast servers and each bare metal server is about uh, 56 core if i remember correctly mm -hmm. um, the actual okay. disk no. is a so the disk themselves it's a dual ssd disk in every single node and then they also have an hpc disk which is connected uh to hop is the all of the nodes are on a telephone network and they're very close to the disk as well yeah. so it's, it's supposed to be very very fast okay thank you very much thank you thank you adam and uh, we have time just for one more question by uh Stian. hello thank you for a very inspiring talk I, I think this is exactly what we need to have in that kind of interface of 
new and advanced users to get them to use hard uh, compute resources. I have one question because you mentioned about how in your question with Alexandra about how you want people to to start adapting and adding their own tools and so on. So how easy is it to add your own tool if you have a, or a tool that isn't currently covered but you want to fit it in into the protocol? Is uh, like how do you package it up and then eventually I guess how would you get it into the mother ship because you want it to be not just on your own installation but in the in the public one so you can get those royalties and so on. So what what do you think is the process for, for adding or modifying, I guess, fixing those integration parts? So I think the process, it's, it's easier when you have a class of things that we've already got. So for example, if you had an MD package, which was not one of the ones we're wrapping, what you would do is basically see the wrappers that we've already generated for Amber, NAMD, Gromax, and then effectively here are the protocols you need to implement and then work out how would you turn this protocol into the input file for your package um, to replicate the, the, the spirit of that protocol. So it does it, what the user would expect it to do for that type of protocol. So it's really essentially writing small Python function that will take a protocol in and then will write out an input file for your program. Um, once you have an input file for your program, ultimately all we're doing is literally just you know, doing a sub process run on that, but in a slightly more clever way to enable us to throw things on the cloud, etc. But that's then just using the wrapper that you've written. Um, in terms of then packaging, um, we're packaging is a real pain, I have to say. Um, so we're currently fighting with Conda uh, of trying to work out how we can get package uh, easy to install packages of Gromac, NAMD, Amber, and all of the other tools. And it is actually very, very difficult. Um, what we've effectively aiming towards is a kind of like a, a Linux distribution of molecular simulation tools. And so what would help us is if you wanted to add a tool, you actually have all of your installation instructions and all your dependencies and make it as easy to install as possible so that we can then basically build um, Docker containers that can then contain your application very cleanly. So that's it. It's kind of like Docker container of your application plus how can you turn make an input file from so the command file from the protocol? Get, if we get the tool into a Docker container, then half the job is done for you in a sense. Yes. Yeah. So and effectively about, with the serverless platform, these things are actually running um, Docker containers, which describes the entire function. Mm -hmm. uh, what about file formats? Because often there could be mismatching file formats. So this is why Biosim Space has a lot of file format converters. So we are continually adding in more file formats so that you don't have to worry about that. So if your thing is taking in an Amber NetCDF binary file as your input, but we will convert anything you need into that file, into that file format for you. If you need things reordered in a particular way, we have things that can reorder the atoms or ensure they have standard names or things like that. So really, the bulk of Biosim space is actually file format converters. And I sometimes think we're, we're very lucky to get funded to write file format converters, because that's <laughs> most of it. It's not the world's most glamorous or fun job, and I, I would say, please, please, people, don't write more file formats, because it's very annoying to have to do them. But as long as you, your tool speaks you know, one of the standard file formats and you haven't created your own file format, then we can convert the input files for you. So you don't have to worry about it. Thank you. Thank you, Stian. Thank you, Chris. Now we are over the time, and uh, I think this was a great discussion. Uh, I encourage uh, all our listeners and future listeners who are viewing this on the web to get in touch with uh, Chris and try out Biosim Space. So thank you all for the webinar uh, attendance today. Thank you to the presenters. Uh, BioExcel will have a uh, summer break with the webinar series uh, and we will continue again in autumn so please follow up our website for, for news and please subscribe to our newsletter which comes uh, once a month and with a very interesting links to uh, events, webinars and other noteworthy articles. Thank you all for today and uh, wish you a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.